A Golden Chain of Divine Aphorisms by Johann Gerhard, translated by Ralph Winterton. Chapter 10. Wherein are contained theological aphorisms concerning free will, that is, the power which is left in man since the fall. The poison of original sin hath quite overrun and inwardly infected all the powers and faculties of man, whereupon there must needs follow great detriment and decrement, or loss and decay in them all. The powers and faculties of man are chiefly to be estimated by the reasonable soul, which was created after the image of God. The faculties of the reasonable soul are two, a mind, to know and understand, and a will, to elect and choose. From the concourse of these two faculties ariseth that which is commonly called free will, which is a faculty both of the mind and the will. For the arbitrament or judgment is of the mind, and the freedom or liberty is of the will. Liberty or freedom is attributed unto the will, first having respect unto the manner of working, which is free and voluntary. For it is not compelled or violently carried away by any external motion, neither doth it work only by a natural instinct, but it hath an internal and free principle, or cause, of its own motion. This liberty is a natural and essential property of the will, and therefore it was not lost by the fall, for the will did not cease to be a will by reason of the fall. This liberty from coaction or necessity is called interior liberty, or liberty in the subject. Therefore the will of man in this respect is always free, though not always good. But yet the will of man is so free, that still it must needs acknowledge the all-ruling power of God, and therefore it is not free from law and obligation. For God hath imprinted in the mind of man certain natural motions, the light and leading whereof the will must follow. If it follows them, it is free. For the true liberty and freedom is to serve God and to obey his law. In which senses, Tully's saying is very good, in his oration for Clantius. We are servants to the laws, that so we may be free men. Therefore, as in respect of liberty or freedom from coaction, man hath always free will. Yea, since his fall. So, in respect of liberty or freedom from obligation, man hath never free will, neither had he before his fall. Again, the liberty or freedom of the will is estimated in respect of the object, which is either good or bad. This is called liberty unto the object and interior. What this liberty or freedom of man's will is, it will best appear from the consideration of the diverse states of man. The liberty in man before his fall was a faculty of his reason and his will, by which he might sin or not sin, stand or fall. For his will, even then, was not immutably determined to that which is good. The will of man was set as it were between two paths. There was set before him life and death. In his mind there shined the light of wisdom. In his will there was conformity to the will of God. But yet notwithstanding there was left in him a liberty, either to persevere in the goodness wherein he was created, or to fall away from it. This may be called a liberty of rectitude, a liberty from servitude and misery, but it was not any essential property of the will, but a separable accident. For as by falling it might be lost, so too truly may we speak it, and not without grief, it was lost. Man abusing his free will lost both himself and it, in which respect the will of man is no longer free, but servile and captivated. Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. The image of God being lost by the fall, the liberty of the rectitude and power of choosing good was also lost. In place whereof there succeeded extreme corruption of the faculties and powers, and an unbridled propension and greediness to that which is evil. Hence it is that the will of man since the fall is only free to that which is evil, which is a wretched and miserable kind of freedom. Or rather it is to be accounted a most heavy and grievous kind of servitude, the Apostle calls it a freedom from righteousness. For man, refusing to be a servant unto righteousness, became subject to the yoke of sin and iniquity, and so a servant to an ill mistress. The soul of man, under this voluntary and unhappily free necessity, is held both as a bondwoman and a free. A bondwoman for necessity, but for will, free. The will of man since the fall is prone to that which is evil, and yet it ceaseth not to be free, because it is not forced by compulsion to that which is evil, but doth freely and willingly choose and embrace it. 
from whence it appears that the inward liberty of will may consist and stand together with the servitude of sinning. As the liberty doth consist with the immutability of doing good, and with the confirmation in goodness, whereof the former is only belonging unto God, and the latter unto the good angels. There remained therefore in man, yea, after the fall, freedom of will, but we must understand it of freedom from coaction. The freedom of will perished in man, if we understand it of the power of choosing good, and eschewing evil. For in the place of light, which shined in the understanding of man being created together with him, there succeeded darkness. Wherefore the understanding of man, as concerning the saving knowledge of God, is not only blind, but quite obscured and put out. The will is become subject unto the tyranny of sin, and waiteth upon it as a slave, in which respect men are said to be dead in their sins. Because by nature they can do nothing, but lie rotting and stinking in the grave of their sins. Wherefore conversion is the work of God alone, in which work man is merely and altogether passive. It is God which openeth the heart of man at his conversion, it is he which doth soften it, circumcise it, and renew it. It is God that worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Man indeed hath an external power, freely to move himself from place to place, and so may perform some civil act of justice. Which of itself indeed, as it is an act, is no sin, but because the person is not yet reconciled unto God, in another respect, is a sin. So that the saying of the apostle stands firm and sure, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. For that works may be truly good, and that in the sight of God, it is necessary that they be done after a good manner, by those that are good, and to a good end. Although then, as concerning outward actions belonging to the life of man, or the outward exercise of religion, there is left some liberty to the will of man. For as the apostle witnesseth, the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. Yet as concerning the beginnings of spiritual motions, and the performing of acceptable service unto God, man hath no power left unto him, no, not at all. For we are not sufficient of ourselves to think anything that is good, as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Therefore, every good thought, every good resolution, every good purpose, every good motion of will is from God, by whom we are able to do something that is good, but without him, nothing. And yet that liberty in external works and actions of this present life is not without some hindrance and impediments. Men often take counsel together, but God which guideth and governeth all things often bring it to naught. We may propound it's God that doth dispose. We wish for what we should not, but God knows. Moreover, great is the tyranny of Satan, who by God's permission draweth whither he listeth, the wills of the reprobate being entangled in the cords of their sins. The weight and burden of sundry business doth often disturb the judgment of the understanding and the arbitrament of the will. Unto which external impediments is also added an internal weakness in the powers of man, even in external things arising from sin, with which weakness there is also joined a disorder of the affections, which like a torrent oftentimes carries away the will and perverts the judgment of the understanding. Which consideration of our powers in spiritual things altogether abolished, and even in external things much weakened, sets before us the greatness of God's grace to be acknowledged by us in our conversion and salvation, driveth security out of our hearts, pulleth down the crests of pride, and maketh us more diligent in praying and keeping the gifts of the Holy Ghost. After conversion, the will of man being freed is not idle, but through power given from above is made operative, and a fellow worker with God. The Holy Ghost without us worketh in us to will that which is good, and when we will, and will after such and such a manner, it is he that worketh together with us, to enable us to work. For the children of God are so moved to working, that they also have a part in the working. This may be called liberty or freedom from the service of sin. For where there is the Spirit of God regenerating and illuminating a man, there is liberty or freedom. But yet that liberty or freedom of the will, being freed, standeth still in need of the aid and guidance of the Holy Ghost. 
For seeing that even in the regenerate, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Therefore, they are not fully free from all sin. In the spirit of the regenerate, there is a free servitude, and in the flesh of the regenerate, there is a servile freedom. In the other life, at length, the regenerate shall obtain full and plenary liberty, or freedom of will, by which they shall be freed not only from the service of sin, but also from all manner of sin, from all misery, and from all fear of falling, which may be called the liberty or freedom from sin and mutability, by which they shall not only not sin, nor only have power not to sin, but also have no power to sin at all, to that liberty and freedom Christ bring us, who is the author of our liberty and freedom.